moat. Tonight we're going to take you deep inside your car, right from your computer. We'll show you how to take that car on a vacation, and we'll learn how to choose a monitor for your computer. Stay tuned for Home Computing. Shouldn't you be taking the car into the shop for that trip? What? You heard me! I guess. Actually, I'm doing that right now. And the program I'm using to do this is Auto Insight for Windows. Let me put this right here. Auto Insight for Windows. Yeah, you ever get that feeling you go to a mechanic and they're going to you, well, you have to work on the such and such, and then you go, oh, I, that's what I thought was wrong with my car, and he goes, I wasn't talking about your car. Ooh. Anyway, what, this might help you with uh, figuring out what's actually wrong with your car and what parts of your car you need to take a look at. Let's go ahead and, as we're in, we're right now into Auto Insight for Windows. We're uh, body exterior is what we're looking at right now. And if you notice, there's little highlights on here. You actually can point to any one of those, and it'll tell you that part of the car. For example, if we point right there, it tells us it's the hood, and that's good information. If you come over here and didn't know where the hood or the headlight was, it would point to it. Let's go ahead, and if we go over to the hood, you can actually click it twice, and it'll take you. It actually pops the hood, and as we go in there, you can see kind of a diagram. As we're going deeper and deeper into the engine, this is kind of like a Disney ride, let's go ahead and go back out. We'll look at, as you notice here, we're looking at the engine. Up above, there are different icons uh, that show you different things you can go into, and we'll get back into those a little bit later. Right now, we're going to go into the engine system, and let's say, for example, you wanted to take, the, take a look at the intake manifold, and you know who wouldn't want to take a look at the intake manifold? We can go click it twice, and we're right in there, and they show the V8 engine, which not only is a picture of the V8 engine, but actually has a neat other function. If you notice straight up above here, there's a little camera. When that's lit up, as it is now, you can get an animation of what's going on in the engine right now. And as the animation builds, you will all of a sudden magically see a V8 engine begin, and it should begin to work any time here. And there it goes, oh, the exciting V8 engine. And this goes on for hour after hour, and it's, it's great. Let's go ahead and back out of here a little bit. We can uh, stop that, and we can actually take a, a deeper look. Let's take a look at intake manifold. We click that twice. It'll actually take you deeper inside the intake manifold. You notice we are getting deeper and deeper into the engine. Um, we can even take a look at the fuel line. And uh, as you notice up above of this, where you're looking at fuel line, up above there is, you can get deeper by looking at the picture. There's a, like a computer screen up here. When you click that, you can actually get deeper into the engine. Or if you want some text, you can click over here, text, and it talks a little bit about the fuel line. Let's go ahead and get out of that. And I'll get back to all the systems you have here. For example, if you click the fan, which is up above, you can take a look at the cooling system. If you click the battery, you get the uh, exciting electrical system. There again, we're back to the engine. We also can get the aircraft and uh, aircraft, the air conditioning, heating. I'm thinking of a different program. And then we got the back to body exterior. We can also go to the exhaust. Way over here, it'll show the fuel system, the steering and suspension. And this thing down here that looks kind of like a tuba or a flashlight is the drivetrain, and I don't know what a tuba has to do with that. And actually, this also has information on uh, the history of cars and the history of certain things. You can get very deep uh, into the car. Uh, you could even load uh, Auto Insight onto a laptop and take it with you to the shop. Um, let's take a look at the system requirements for Auto Insight for Windows. So now that Auto Insight has taught you enough about your car so you feel confident enough to take it for a spin, uh, maybe a vacation. And if you're silly enough to take a long driving vacation, and if you're the kind of dad who likes to plan every last detail of the fun, try vac Great Vacations, which we're looking at right now. And uh, we're on the main screen here for Great Vacations. You'll notice up in the upper left-hand corner, to plan your Great Vacation, you may want to pick a type of vacation. For example, skiing. We could click skiing. And you know in the lower left-hand corner here, it explains to you some of the information it has about skiing. For example, choosing destinations, evaluating ski schools, cross-country skiing, you name it. Let's go and look at uh, some other ones real quick. Cabins has some information on cabins, RV, kind of a Lincoln thing. Um, uh, we got tennis and golf vacations, resorts, cruises. Cruises, you notice here we have uh, Costa Cruises, Queen Elizabeth II Cruises, all those, the information on those. Adventure. And, you know, nature is a you know, adventure, pack trips, nothing more adventurous than a pack trip, sailing. And we'll go ahead over here to the ranch. Let's say you want to work on the farm. 
and that's a great vacation working on the old farm. Uh, we can go back to, uh, so uh, let's say in our case, we were thinking of taking a trip to the family in Philadelphia. So let's go ahead and let's click over to on cities, which was next to skiing. And then we can come down here. You notice one of the cities doesn't have every city in the country, and, uh, but Philadelphia is one of them. So let's go ahead and take a look at Philadelphia. And it has information for Philadelphia. For example, it has tours, things to see. Let's go ahead and take a look really quickly at things to see in Philadelphia. And we're in things to see. There's, there's in Philadelphia, there's East Philadelphia, Center City in Fairmount Park. Let's see what's in Center City. And in Center City, of course, we have the Please Touch Museum, the famous Please Touch Museum where kids can touch anything they want except for the other children. Let's go ahead and get out of there. And we'll go down here and let's actually add Center City into our itinerary. Now that's for the 19th. We're building an uh, itinerary for the 19th. And uh, let's go ahead and take a look at other things we can do in Philadelphia. For example, there's tours. One of them being the Centipede Candlelight Tour, showing you right there. The Centipede Candlelight Tour was voted the best in Philly, and I guess you go see centipedes by candlelight, and man, does that sound fun. Let's go ahead and click off of that, and we can add that to our itinerary, so that'll be happening. Uh, another thing we can add, for example, accommodations. This actually has hotels and different things you can, um, you know, different places you can stay while in Philly. Uh, let's go ahead and pick La Reserve, has information, bed and breakfast, blah, 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 uh, information there. Close out of that, and we'll go ahead and add that in there. So that shows our itinerary. We also have a different. We have reports we can do too. You can not only uh, build your whole itinerary. You can look at a summary. You can look at uh, different days. You can plan your whole itinerary. And uh, one thing about great vacations, uh, the information about some destinations is pretty limited. So you still might want to take uh, a travel guide or keep one handy. Uh, let's take a quick, quick drive through the system requirements. Now you've got your vacation plan, all you need to do is map out the route. AutoMap Road Atlas does exactly that. And uh, let's take a quick look. We're looking at the main screen here. Uh, we're going to plan a trip. And as you notice here, there's a menu up above. There are three flags in the center. The green one showing you where you're going to be actually departing your trip. Once you click it, there's a flag that you bring down. Our de uh, departure will be from the beautiful Mile High City, Denver, Colorado, home of the Denver Broncos. And then we will be going to Philadelphia to do that. We will be clicking the yellow flag, or I mean the, the checkered flag, eventually. But first what we'll have to do is uh, shrink down into the Philadelphia area. You notice there's big cities, uh, New York, Washington, Boston, but Philadelphia is down here. So what we're going to do is we can actually zoom in to an area, which is actually a neat function. We'll go ahead and zoom in in that area, zoom down, and we will notice Philadelphia here any second. There it is, way in the lower, lower left-hand corner. Then we will take our checkered flag, click that, bring it down to Philadelphia. And when we do that, that is our trip. We can also, if we'd like to, uh, the yellow, use the yellow flag for any vias we may want to hit along the way. You know, for example, you want to stop in Chicago or whatever. As you hit up here in the calculator, this actually calculates your trip. We'll click that. And this gives you different options you can use. The, the quickest route, the shortest route, your preferred route. Uh, that would be if you want to see, uh, you know, stick to, let's say, more scenic highways, things of that nature. We can go ahead and hit OK there, which I should have done a second ago. And we've got, uh, it is now planning our trip out and it's doing it very fast, faster than I could do it. And it looks like we're done calculating. And this will actually give us a route all the way to Philadelphia from Denver. And we'll expand this out. And you notice we've got a, a nice route here. You depart Denver, Colorado, you stay on I-70, you go east. Neat thing about this is you've got, as we click out here to the outside, it tells you that you go on that road for 10 miles. Even though you're staying on I-70 for a long time, uh, for 10 miles, you'll pass Aurora. Then you go another 186 miles, and you keep aiming for Topeka. And, and obviously, you keep aiming for Topeka, but it kind of gives you a breakdown as to what you're doing on the way. Let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, other route information, I believe. Places, oh, places of interest is another thing you may want to do. If you click, this will tell you that when you're looking for places of interest, um, within 20 miles of your route, these are anything that might be neat that you may see along the way. And it shows you parks, mountains and ranges, natural features, or water features. We're kind of interested in parks. Let's go ahead and select parks. Hit OK. And let's see what beautiful parks along our route we may see here. Oh, it actually shows us the parks in our uh, itinerary, which is great. Or we can go back to the window somehow. We should be able to go to the map. Oh, we can't go that way. Let's shrink this down. And we've got map view. 
and we should be able to go and there's our route you can see our route from Denver to Philadelphia as we expand this up a little bit you can actually point at parks along the way if you want to get that information and there's some all these green spots for example that green spots a park we'll push that and that's worlds of fun Missouri and that's where we're stopping on the trip darn it and let's go ahead and go up here to the tape measure this is another little function it's got called the tape measure you can actually take a spot for example you want to find out from Minneapolis to Kansas City how far it is as the crow flies this is a direct route kind of thing it gives you in the corner 415 miles you can also click on certain routes to tell you you know how to get the Memphis it tells you it's route 57 that's route 44 and now why don't we go ahead and map out those system requirements look like a car mechanic. He's not a mechanic. He's a monitor guy. And when we come back, we'll find out what we need to know before we buy a new monitor, and hopefully he'll know something about vehicles. Lovers, we are here, and I'm glad you stuck around because we have a good guest today. Uh, Jerry Johnston with CW Electronics is going to tell us a little bit about monitors. Jerry, welcome. Thanks a lot for coming. Pleasure to be here. You met the wife? You bet. Okay, that's all you're going to say. Good. <laughs> and uh, do you know anything about working on cars at all? Oh, never mind. We'll, that, we'll talk about that later. I do have a question for you. Mm -hmm. People are uh, moving to larger monitors now. Yes, they are. Uh, could we talk a little bit about that and why they'd be doing that? Sure. Uh, with the advent of Windows and the amount of people that are working on their desktops for uh, making publishing and word processing and home and work and business and all at the same time, uh, they need to have more room on their screens to work with more information at the same time. So when they're working on a uh, newsletter for their company, they need to be able to see some text and second pages and that kind of thing. Mm. Also in graphics and displays, uh, they need to have toolbars and such. And on a larger screen, they get to see more of those tools at the same time and save time from jumping back and forth on screens. So we actually have uh, more windows on the same screen versus a larger picture. It's just... Uh, right. Just Basically, in a 17-inch monitor, you have about a 56% increase in viewing capacity. Oh, really? Oh. So you take your normal screen, and then you put about a 1-inch ribbon around the outside hmm. of it, and you can use that for toolbars or for putting extra work. Oh, great. And that normal screens, then, people have now 13? 14? 14 inches. 14 inches now. Mm -hmm. I always get confused. Now, uh, tell me the difference between, you always hear when you're buying a monitor, VGA, SVGA, XVGA. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's right. start stepping through those. VGA is 640 by 480. Okay. SVGA is 800 by 600. Okay. And XVGA is 1024 by 768. And those numbers you're referring to are pixels? Pixels on the screen. Pixels right. on the screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as we, the, the more pixels, the better the picture. <laughs> exactly. Okay. The more clarity and the, and the crisper the, the screen is going to look. Okay. Great. So then how does that relate to the other thing you hear about interlaced and non-interlaced? Right. When you think about the 1024 by 768, you actually have lines on your screen. And when it's interlaced, it's refreshing every other line in each cycle. And oh. when it's non-interlaced, it refreshes every single line every cycle. Okay. Uh, go over refresh rate with me. Then. Okay. It's the speed in which a, a new screen will be generated when you've made a change on your document or on a drawing. Okay. How fast you get that finished product back up on the screen. Okay. So as you move the cursor down, it refreshes the whole screen very rapidly. Right. In a cursor, you generally don't need a uh, refresh rate. isn't really important because you're moving a very small part of your screen. But if you were to make a page change from the top of page one to the bottom of page two, your refresh rate now becomes oh, very important because sure. you're redrawing the entire page. Kind of like moving from the top of a WordPerfect document all the way down to the bottom. Right. Okay. Another term I've heard as I've looked at monitors, dot pitch. Mm -hmm. what the heck dot that pitch is relating to how clear the pixel is going to be. It actually oh. refers to the size of the pixel. And what we're working with are fractions. So it's a dot two eight pitch, a dot two six pitch is one of our, the better monitors that are out there now. Okay, so dot two six would be the, a better one. Right. Okay. What's a local local bus? Is this all? Is local right? bus. Local bus and Visa video are uh, a ways for the video cards to interact with the CPU in a much faster way. Okay. Well, why don't we take a look at some of the things you brought that okay. way? Maybe we can tie this in. In the basic uh, SVGA video, uh, we're still in about a hundred dollar price point um, for one meg of video RAM. Okay. So, that's so you can keep your uh, 
refresh rates are high. Okay. Um, and it's, it will, this will work with all your 14-inch monitors, no problem whatsoever. Okay. Because when people get a bigger, better monitor, they need a, bet, a new graphics adapter usually? Right. Because those smaller graphics adapters don't have enough RAM to hold the whole picture in one uh, segment of RAM, and they don't have the refresh rate to do it fast enough. Okay. So they have to go to a Windows Accelerator hmm. card so they can get more RAM so that they can have more video because your picture is bigger. Okay. And then your accelerator that also helps your refresh rate. Oh, great. Okay. And what do we got here? This is a. Uh, right. This is the MGA Power Graphics. And this is the kind of board you would use when you're doing any kind of animation or um, uh, advanced 3D modeling or such like that. I see. So these actually have a, uh, a faster interface with the processor on the computer. Okay so that it can use the RAM there as well as the processor. And then it also has a processor built onto this card. Okay, so, oh, okay. So this would be like the next evolutionary step in graphics adapters then? Right. This is what you get up to when you're starting to use, it's actually a computer on a computer. Okay, oh, wow, okay, <laughs> that's great. Um, yeah, because I seem to be, when I was buying CGA, it was EGA. When I was buying EGA, it was VGA, and I've kind of followed one step up the evolutionary ladder a little bit late. Um, so this would be, we'd be looking at for Matrix maybe to be the, the next level. Well, great, well, you've been very informational. Thanks so much for coming. You bet. And uh, it's one of the most popular programs ever. We're going to find out about the latest version when we come back to Home Computing. one of the most popular programs ever. When it first came out, people started whole businesses based on just using Lotus. This is, oh, this is release four, it's a heavy box. Um, this is, uh, Pete, you actually have to judge Lotus by the pound now. For those of you who haven't used Lotus, it's a spreadsheet. You use it to organize information like sales figures for regions or months, things like that. You can use it for budgets also. Uh, the key point about a spreadsheet is that if you change a number somewhere in the spreadsheet, it changes all of the other totals or other numbers based on that number. Uh, Release 4 for Windows has some new features like drag and drop for moving cells and neat new tab system for organizing multi-sheet spreadsheets. But the best part for non-Lotus users is the new, an uh, new animation that it has for demonstrating all of the new features. In fact, we'll be looking at that right now. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the new features. You notice here we have a menu that you can look at all sorts of things, the macros, the databases, the drawing, the charts. Uh, we're going to go ahead and look at the hot new features. It had some hot licks here in Lotus, the hot Lotus new licks. And basically, uh, little guy comes up in a tuxedo and uh, he talks about things you can do with the new Lotus. You can organize, organize excuse me, your data in spreadsheets. It's got uh, showing you how you can break your spreadsheets up into different regions. For example, you can use a separate sheet for each region and one to summarize. You can look at any sheet by clicking its tab and you know on the upper left there there's an A, B and a C tab and as you click it you can actually go back and forth. The sheet starts out but gives, gets each one the letter. There you go. And there's your summary. That would be north and south together is summary. See some of the new features. Version manager lets you test assumptions and analyze scenarios. Another important thing about a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet is, uh, I can almost say that word, is actually uh, running examples or tests of what your business would be like if things changed in your operation and all the numbers will change accordingly. Right now it's doing a CD to cassette comparison, changing some numbers. And we uh, got the CDs. This range named CD has three versions, sales up, sales down, and steady. So as you change the numbers, the graph is changing. Or in this case, it would be a chart. It's a 3D chart. In fact, maybe what we'll do real quickly as it changes. We can also, if you know down here in the right-hand right corner, so I can get this information in, uh, you can actually, if, you, uh, if he was going too fast, you can go reverse. You can pause it to read it a little bit more slowly. Or you can actually move forward very quickly if you wanted to skip by it and do some more information late, late, uh, later on um, like that. You can also, by using the, the bar on the bottom, you can use the menu to go back to any of the other projections. It tells you about using your network. And let's see what else we got here. Quick menus let you select an item very quickly. A lot of new features for Lotus. Uh, Lotus, though, is a huge program. It takes about 8 megabytes on your hard drive. And let's take a look at the other system requirements.
Earlier in the program, we did Auto Insight for Windows, which allowed you to look inside your automobile. Now we're looking at Body Insight for Windows, which surprisingly enough allows you to look inside, you guessed it, the body. And, uh, and this actually may come in handy because we may want to find out what a full bladder is because we've got a long driving trip coming up. Let's go ahead and look at some of the main menu items you can uh, look at here for Body Insight. For example, you can look at the skeletal system. You can look at your uh, digestive system. You can look at your muscular system. Let's go ahead and go into the brain for now to see how many brain cells we had left after my college days. So let's go ahead and, okay, so we've got, uh, here's a side view of the brain. Uh, you can look at all, obviously you can see a lot of names here. If it, these are a little harder. These are names we may not have seen before. Let's go ahead and look at, oh, how about this one? Central Sulcus of Rolando, which is also a city in Mexico, coincidentally. And we have all these little highlights on the brain here that we can click. If you don't know what one part is, you can click it. It'll point to mental frontal gyrus. And we've also got uh, many text items here. You can give a pop quiz, final exam. You can look at some scores. You've got information. Oops, let's get out of there. And we can look at some other just topics that they supply with the program about pregnancy, about different tests. So we'll go ahead and get out of there. And uh, we've got zoom functions. You can also do something else that's real neat. It's called the bird's eye function. You can actually bring it down to the bird's eye function and you can draw an area you would like to look at in a, in a tighter uh, scope there. It'll bring you right down to the area you want to look at. Uh, Body Insight for Windows, real easy to install on your system. Why don't we take a look at the system requirements? Hey, thanks for joining us today. I got that monitor guy out working on my car. Hopefully he'll get it done in time so I can go on vacation. Thanks for joining Home Computing.